Well, good morning, South Union, and to all of our online listeners, welcome back to another wonderful Lord's Day. Today we are going to be um, starting a sermon series called The Son of God, in which I want to share with us the fullness of how we know from Scripture that Jesus is indeed the Son of God. Before we begin, let's have our Scripture readings. Our first scripture reading for today comes from Matthew chapter 2, verses 1 and 2. Now after Jesus was born in Bethlehem of Judea in the days of Herod the king, behold, wise men from the east came to Jerusalem, saying, Where is he who has been born king of the Jews? For we saw his star when it rose, and have come to worship him. Our second scripture reading for today comes from the book of Romans, chapter 10, verses 14 through 18. How then will they call on him in whom they have not believed? And how are they to believe in him of whom they have not heard? And how are they to hear without someone preaching? And how are they to preach unless they are sent? As it is written, how beautiful are the feet of those who preach the good news. But they have not all obeyed the gospel. For Isaiah says, Lord, who has believed what he has heard from us? So faith comes from hearing, and hearing through the word of Christ. But I ask, have they not heard? Indeed they have. For their voice has gone out to all the earth, and their words to the ends of the world. And our final scripture reading for this morning is Revelation chapter 12, verses 1 through 6. And a great sign appeared in heaven, a woman clothed with the sun, with the moon under her feet, and on her head a crown of twelve stars. She was pregnant and was crying out in birth pains and the agony of giving birth. And another sign appeared in heaven. Behold, a great red dragon, with seven heads and ten horns, and on his heads seven diadems. His tail swept down to the third of the stars of heaven and cast them to the earth. And the dragon stood before the woman who was about to give birth, so that when she bore her child, he might devour it. She gave birth to a male child, one who is to rule all the nations with a rod of iron. But her child was caught up to God and to his throne. And the woman fled into the wilderness, where she has a place prepared by God, in which she is to be nourished for 1,260 days. Let's begin our sermon time together this morning with a word of prayer. Our Father, in the name of the Lord Jesus and in the power of your Holy Spirit, we come before your throne of grace. Father, we thank you so very much for your goodness and your love for your strength, and for your kindness. Father, we thank you so very much for who you are, for your sovereignty, for your providence, for your goodness. Father, we thank you so very much that you sent your Son to reveal yourself to us. We thank you for Jesus Christ. We thank you for his birth and his life and his teachings for his death on the cross to atone for our sins and for the resurrection. Jesus, we thank you that you are alive and well, having conquered death and are now ascended and seated at the right hand of God. Father in Jesus, we thank you so very much for your Holy Spirit who is here with us and in us and among us. Now, Lord God, we pray that you would be with us in this time. Teach us, O Lord God, Show us something majestic today about the birth of your Son, Jesus Christ. In your name do we pray. Amen. 
So we are going to be beginning this sermon series on uh, the Son of God, in which I want to share with you the fullness of how we know from Scripture that Jesus is indeed the Son of God. Now, of course, we're not going to be able to hit on every single point, but in this time of Advent, what we want to be doing is focusing on Jesus' birth. And so I'm going to try as hard as I can to focus on things that reveal that Jesus is the Son of God from the way that Jesus was born. Now, I know many people are probably asking, why do we need such a series? Scripture says it, I believe it, that settles it. Well, indeed, you're correct for the most part. I definitely hope that uh, if Scripture is saying it and we understand what the Scripture is meaning, that we then believe it and that would then settle the issue. Um, However, I think that also we can always have times of going deeper with the Lord and deeper into our understanding of Scripture. And so the first thing that this sermon series is going to try to do is continue to undergird, continue to support, continue to give foundation to the belief and the faith and the trust and the knowledge that Jesus is the Son of God. The second reason why we want to have such a sermon series is that in our nation today, in the United States of America, including in the U.S. church, the doctrine that Jesus is the Son of God has already come under attack and is in some areas considered irrelevant. There are folks outside the church who only think that Jesus is a good moral teacher if they even think that of him. And we need to be prepared with ways that we can share with them that Jesus is in fact the Son of God. Not only that, but even in the church, there are some people who don't believe that Jesus is the Son of God, but was only a good moral teacher or someone to look up to and things like that. And to that, we need to say, no, there is something special about Jesus. There is something divine about Jesus. Actually, he is the unique Son of God, making reference to John 3.16. And so today we're going to focus on Jesus as the Son of God, specifically with the signs that accompanied Jesus' birth and proclaimed that he was divine. And it makes God, or it makes Jesus fully God and fully human. Let's start by looking at Matthew chapter 2, verses 1 through 2. Now, after Jesus was born in Bethlehem of Judea in the days of Herod the king, behold, wise men from the east came to Jerusalem, saying, Where is he who has been born king of the Jews? For we saw his star when it rose, and we have come to worship him. Now, my question for you this morning is, how do you imagine that the star rose. What does it mean? What is this star that's in the sky and rising? And for me, I never really could understand what this star was. And and for some weird reason, I thought that maybe God had put a brand new star in the sky, but not really knowing a whole lot about stars, I didn't know if that was really possible or if God would do it. Not only that, I wouldn't know where to look to see it, right? And because presumably if you put it in the sky, it would probably still be shining. And so that was one of my ideas. And I think I was, I was not helped by well-intentioned children's Bible stories and well-intentioned Christmas cards. And you know, in, in children's Bible stories, they, they have this star that is literally shining. If here's the manger, the star is literally right here above it, just shining out as if no one could miss it. And really the only people who somehow see this star is the three wise men, or and it's always three wise men. Now, The Bible story, our scripture story, doesn't say that it's just three wise men, but it's always three wise men because there were three gifts. And so in the children's Bible stories, there's this star shining right over the manger and the gifts are coming. And even in in artistically rendered or or well-intentioned Christmas cards, you have this manger on one side and this star as big as a moon on this other side, and somehow it's shining down like the sun to rest on the face of Jesus. And then you see the, the, the wise men coming up maybe in the background. 
And really, when we see these things, we, we kind of just accept them. It's, it's a cultural thing that it tries to make sense of the story. But really, we should begin to ask some questions. Like, if that's the way it happened, why didn't anyone else anywhere bother to come and check out what is going on? I mean, it, it would be pretty significant if a star the size of the moon shining down with the force of the sun on Jesus, uh, that other people might come and check it out. But they never do. It's only somehow the wise men that see it, right? And that just doesn't make any sense. Um, it, it can't be how it actually happened. And so what is this story about? Well, it's, it's because God didn't make a brand new star for Jesus, um, nor did he make a star shine down with the power of the sun or, or become as big as the moon or, or shine down with the force of the moon directly on the manger. That's not how God normally works, and that's not how God worked at this time. The wise men, most likely from Babylon or, or Persia, somewhere in there, were people who knew a bit about the Jewish scriptures. Um, remember in, in Babylon, uh, the great prophet Daniel rose up. Uh, the Jews were located in Babylon. Then we get the story of Esther. Jews were also located throughout Persia during that time. Not all of them came back from exile. And so there's still Jewish scriptures and Jewish knowledge in those areas. Most likely the wise men were at least familiar with things like the passage in Isaiah chapter 7 verse 14, where the child will be born of a virgin. But here's the thing about these wise men. The wise men were master astronomers. They were stargazers. They, they, their, their profession or part of their profession was to make note of the movement of the stars. And so when they saw the star arising and what would appear to maybe us who are untrained observers would be a normal night sky that we see from Earth. And yet they were able to take note of this star rising as well as if they're looking up at the heavens in the normal sky um, context that we would see, uh, they would also have the heavenly context. They would be seeing a whole sky full of stars and the star that is rising would be placed by them in its context amongst the stars. And so... What happens then at this night when, when the wise men see that Jesus is born that makes them set out on their travels? Remember, they're not already traveling and then see the star rise. They see this heavenly scene. They see the star risen. They see the context in which it's in. And the context and their interpretation of it makes them then set out on their journey and on their travels. Um, and so the night sky, this night when they see the star rise, um, is, is a rare event. Um, not only is the star rising a, a semi-rare event in and of itself, but the heavenly context is like a once in several thousand years happening. I mean, it's an extremely rare event when the entire night sky, the night that they saw, is all put together. And it is those signs that help us to interpret and understand Jesus is the Son of God. Now, a brief disclaimer here. I am not promoting astrology or horoscopes. Uh, if you're doing that stuff and you're a Christian, please stop. That, that's a pagan sort of stuff, um, and it's, it's usually about linking the destiny of people uh, being proclaimed and or tied up with the stars or somehow the stars determining fate. And we even have turns of phrase, right, that say, it's written in the stars. No, that, that's garbage and trash. Please don't go, go there. Don't do that sort of stuff. What we're doing is not that. What we're doing is something called astral prophecy. Astral prophecy is this, um, and I want to define it carefully so that we don't get confused. This definition comes from Dr. Michael Heiser, um, and I'm just paraphrasing it a little bit for us. It means this, that God used the stars, the stuff he made, the heavenly scene, on the night of Jesus' birth to declare something to the world, 
so that the world could know and understand something that is happening in that moment. It doesn't mean that God does it incessantly. It doesn't mean that God does it all the time. It means this one time he did something special for the birth of his son, which could make sense to us if we think about that just for a few minutes. Now, what do I mean that God would communicate something to us through the stars? Well, let's move into Romans chapter 10 just for a moment. And in Romans chapter 10, what we're going to find is this context about Paul sharing with um, his, he, with his uh, hearers, because remember the letters would have been read, with his hearers and also to an extent with his readers, how they would be saved. And so, of course, we get this magnificent line in verse 10, for with, one, with the heart one believes and is justified, with the mouth one confesses and is saved. Then he goes on in verses 14 through 17 to talk about how people are saved. Well, they need to be able to hear the message. They need to be able to believe the message. They need to have somebody sent so that they can hear the message and believe the message. And not only that, but these, um, uh, you know, those, those people who are, are sent to proclaim the gospel sometimes aren't believed, but the, they're, they're, they're beautiful people, those who proclaim the gospel. And then in verse 18, he says this, But I ask, have they not heard? And he answers it, indeed they have. Now remember, the context is talking about salvation in Jesus Christ. The context is not talking about just God being a mighty creator. Actually, Paul assumes and presumes that even in Romans chapter 1. Right here, he's talking about the gospel. He's talking about Jesus. And he's saying, hey, the whole world should have known something was up because Jesus was born. What does he reference? Indeed they have, for their voice has gone out to all the earth, and their words to the end of the world. Here, Paul is actually making reference to the first few verses of Psalm chapter 19. The heavens are declaring the glory of God, and the firmament, or the sky, proclaim his handiwork. Um, There the psalmist is not talking about the spiritual heaven, i.e. the place where God resides. He's talking about the physical heavens. He's talking about literally the night sky. The heavens are telling the glory of God. The firmament proclaims his handiwork. Day to day pours forth speech. Night to night declares knowledge. Uh, Their voice um, is not heard. Um, Was let me see here. Um, There there is no speech nor their words. Their voice is not heard. Yet their voice goes out through all the earth and their words to the ends of the world. Their voice goes out through all the earth and their words to the end of the world. Now, something we're going to come back to is actually their voice goes out through all the earth. That's in the Greek translation, otherwise known as the Septuagint. The Hebrew text actually reads, their line goes out through all the earth. And we'll come back to that point in a few minutes. Um, And sometimes you'll be able to find that in a footnote down at the bottom of Psalm 19. So what is Paul doing here in Romans chapter 10? He's clearly referencing the sun and the stars as a way of saying that people should have known something specific about Jesus coming to earth within the context of Romans 10. That there is a divine human king, right? A God human king person who came to earth. How do they know? Something in the sky. Now, of course, we have Matthew chapter 2 to help guide us there. The question that we need to ask then is this. Is there any other passage in the New Testament that talks about the sky and the stars in relation to Jesus's birth? And there is. Revelation chapter 12 verses 1 through 7. Now, this sermon is actually based on the research of Dr. Michael Heiser, who's an Old Testament scholar, um, and he he does wonderful things. He's at the Awakening School of Theology in Florida, has um, a wonderful biblical podcast called the Naked Bible Podcast, and he has also a 501c3 called McClot. Um, Wonderful uh, scholar, uh, in my opinion. He's a wonderful biblical-based scholar. 
He did research on this with an astronomer who was using an astronomical program to basically go back in time and take a look around in, within the first century, right around the time Jesus is born, to figure out if there are signs in the sky that would match both Matthew 2 and Revelation chapter 12, verse 1 through 7. And what they found is amazing. Now, it's only amazing in its full context because each individual thing has just a, um, a varying frequency. But when it's all together, it happens only once every few thousand years. And so it's very, very interesting. If you, since you were watching this on our public YouTube page, um, I'm not able to show the slides that he has um, over the internet as is. However, if you check out the description underneath this link, I will tell you how to go and find the slides that he has put together and so that you can see what we're talking about in a very pictorial way. And that has really helped me understand all of this. Um, so Revelation chapter 12, let's take a look. If you turn there with your Bibles, just want to talk about the wise man star just for a moment here. Uh, the star that the wise men saw was most likely Jupiter, the king planet, moving into conjunction with Regulus, the king star. The star seen at its conjoined rising, right? So this star would have shined brighter because of those two um, uh, uh, heavenly entities, we might just say, because of this planet and the star aligning, um, those two would have then shined out brighter upon the world. Um, and now, here's the thing about Jupiter as the king planet. It's famous for the appearance of retrograde motion. Now, retrograde motion is the appearance of the appearance that Jupiter actually um, will move backwards in the night sky. And so that's one of the things that Jupiter is famous for. It has the appearance of retrograde motion. It has the appearance of moving backwards in the night sky. And so hence in Matthew chapter 2 verse 9, And behold, the star that they had seen when it rose went before them until it came to rest over the place where the child was. Most likely that's talking about Jupiter's retrograde motion. Jupiter's kind of guiding them along the way. Now that's cool, right? All right, so, so sweet. We we're able to identify the star at its rising. Probably something cool. We hear these terms king planet and king star, Jupiter and Regulus aligning, and we're already starting to think about Jesus in that context. Jesus is also going to be king. Let's check out Revelation chapter 12 and see what else we have here for us. Look at this, and a great sign appeared in heaven, a woman clothed with the sun, with the moon under her feet. Now, how do we know we're talking about the night sky? Well, in ancient astronomical language, um, a something being clothed with the sun is, is pretty stock language, meaning it's, it's normal language when talking about the sun and the stars, okay, and the movements thereof. And when the sun passes through a constellation, that constellation is clothed with the sun. And a great sign appeared in heaven, a woman clothed with the sun and the moon under her feet, and on her head a crown of twelve stars. She was pregnant and was crying out in birth pains in the agony of giving birth. And another sign appeared in heaven, behold a great red dragon with seven heads and ten horns, and on his head seven diadems. His tail swept down a third of the stars of heaven and cast them to the earth. And the dragon stood before the woman who was about to give birth, so that when she bore her child, he might devour it. She gave birth to a male child, one who is to rule all the nations with a rod of iron, but her child was caught up to God and his throne. The woman fled into the wilderness. Now, in kind of our normal interpretations, this is always talking about Jesus. How do we know? Verse 5, um, the one who is to rule all the nations with a rod of iron, that's an allusion to Psalm chapter 2, verse 9, which is a messianic 
psalm, right? That's a messianic prophecy that there is going to be a king who rules over all the nations, specifically with a rod of iron. And here as Christians, we understand that's going to be Jesus. And notice we're actually, in John, in his vision, is receiving this and is really um, uh, putting in Jesus' whole life story even into a single verse, Remember, visions are kind of weird, right? They, they operate awkwardly. And so um, visions here, we have Jesus, um, the, the virgin giving birth. Uh, that's Jesus. And then Jesus gets taken up to heaven, talking about the ascension. So then who is the woman in these verses? Well, very traditional interpretations would be something like Israel. Um, Israel is referred to as the Virgin of Zion, 2 Kings 19, verse 21, Isaiah 37, 21, Jeremiah 14, 17. Uh, it could also be Mary, very standard interpretation, because Mary is the human virgin who gave birth to Jesus. Um, and, and really, overall, usually we come to terms with this simply being the faithful community. Remember, in visions, things can sometimes mean multiple things. There are allusions to multiple things going on. Um, So that's usually the standard interpretation. Here's the thing. The woman appears as a sign in heaven. Now, the Virgin Mary gave literal birth to Jesus on the earth. But she wasn't in heaven in the sky. right? And she wasn't clothed with the sun. Israel is uh, metaphorically referred to as a virgin, and of course, uh, the church later on is always referred to as the bride of Christ, presuming also virginity there. Uh, But neither are they like in heaven clothed with the sun as astronomy language. The question is, is there um, a woman considered a virgin in astronomy? And there is. The constellation Virgo is the only constellation that represents a woman in the night sky. And it just so happens that um, the Virgo um, on, on, in, the, in the year 3 BC, which is the year Jesus is born, happens to be on the ecliptic, which is the um, imaginary line that the sun travels through the sky. Okay, um, and so the constellation Virgo is right there as the sun is able to cross over. Now, Virgo is an interesting constellation because she has 12 stars located around her head, which gives her the semblance of a crown. The sun passes through Virgo, Virgo clothing her for 20 days every year. So that's not a really rare phenomenon. It happens every single year, uh, 20 days of that year. So it's relatively common. Now, all of this is going to come back to the wise men. So let's go ahead and just simply ask a simple question. How did the wise men know that the virgin uh, or the Virgo was clothed with the sun when you can't see the constellation because the sun is shining? Very very honest question, right? If the sun's up, you ain't seeing no stars. We ain't seeing no stars, right? So how do they know? Well, the same practice that astronomers have used for thousands of years, math. They used math. They knew where the stars were, and they tracked where the sun and the stars were, and they used math in order to figure this stuff out so that they knew the virgin was going to be clothed with the sun. Um, now, in 3 BC, the year of Jesus' birth, Virgo, the virgin, was clothed with the sun between August the 27th and September the 15th. Now, normally that would represent the birth of someone, specifically with the constellation Virgo that has meaning. Here's the thing. The moon, spoken about in Revelation chapter 12, verse um, 1, the moon under her feet, is under her feet for a 90-minute time period during the 20 days that Virgo is clothed with the sun. 90 minutes during that time. Uh, The moon kind of operates a little weird, so it's only 90 minutes that it's at Virgo's feet. And it's specifically at Virgo's feet on September the 11th, 3 BC. 
And so if this is indeed Revelation 12 is talking about Jesus' birth, we can conclude even just from those signs that we're talking about something on September the 11th, 3 BC. Now, here's where it gets even cooler. Remember how I said that the king star and the king planet, Regulus and Jupiter, were in conjunction allowing the wise men to see the star. These two were in conjunction between September the 14th, 3 BC, and September the 11th, 3 BC. You see things starting to line up. More on this in just a few minutes. However, at this point, you're beginning to see some connections, hopefully, in the night sky. So Jupiter and the, and the king planet of, and Regulus, the king star, are aligning, as well as Virgo is down underneath, and the sun is coming around in its orbit, and during um, September the 11th, 3 BC, the moon is at Virgo's feet. Back to Revelation chapter 12. Notice in Revelation chapter 12, verse 3, another sign appears in heaven, a great red dragon with seven heads and ten horns with crowns on its heads. There are two options for this in the night sky of September the 11th, 3 BC, when the moon is at Virgo's feet and the sun clothed Virgo. First is Scorpio, which is gigantic in ancient times. It was a huge constellation, and it's immediately below Virgo. Or Hydra, which is a little standoffish, but still standing at the feet of Virgo. Um, and it was considered a great dragon. Now, here's the thing about Hydra. Hydra is always accompanied by two other constellations. One is Korax, made of seven stars, i.e. the seven heads of the dragon, and um, Crater, which is a constellation of ten stars, i.e. the ten horns on the heads. Now, Hydra is also in ancient uh, Greek mythology, is a dragon um, with multiple heads. And so this all kind of makes sense within the historical context as well as in the context of the sky, that there is this dragon, Virgo, Jupiter, and Regulus aligned, um, the sun coming down, and the dragon just seems to be waiting to devour that child. Not only that, but there's another scene in the sky, another part of the scene that some folks may be able to guess at, but that Dr. Heiser and his astronomer kind of rolled back the clock and took a look. Regulus is, of course, one of the um, anchor points for the constellation Leo, which is a lion. So on September the 11th, 3 BC, when all these things are happening in the night sky, Regulus and Jupiter are aligned in this lion constellation directly above Virgo. Now, the lion we should immediately begin thinking about in reference to Jesus in such places as Revelation 5. Jesus is the Lion of the tribe of Judah. And remember from Genesis chapter 49 that Jacob pronounces a prophecy and a blessing upon Judah that the scepter would never part from Judah. And so we're beginning to pay, part, um, get, connect things together here. But just remember also that, of course, the tribe of Judah is where the Davidic dynasty comes from. And so you, you have King David coming from the tribe of Judah, from which uh, is promised a, a Messiah. And here in the night sky, while there's a, a birth happening that is divine, it's coming through Virgo and the moons at the feet, indicating royalty, enemy at the side, um, Jupiter and Regulus are combined, also indicating royalty royalty and divinity, they're located in a lion, the lion of the tribe of Judah. Now, here's the thing. In pagan thought, Leo, the lion, was also always associated with both royalty and divinity. So this, this night sky scene on September the 11th, 3 BC, is interpreted by the wise men as a divine royal birth pronounced to the entire world. And the wise men knew what they were looking at, so they got the message. Many other people didn't. And here's the thing. This birth is so important. It's so important because of the signs in the sky that the wise men travel to go and see Jesus. And they bring him gifts. 
worthy of a king. How do they know? The heavenly context in the night sky. Now, um, uh, the important thing here is that all of these all of these conjunctions are happening at once, which is only every few thousand years. It does not mean that we turn into sky watchers. It doesn't mean God is always revealing things in his plans in the heavens. It means this one time he did. And remember that God is sovereign and he can do what he wants. And so this one time he did. Now here's the thing. Here's the thing. How do we know the, where the wise men, how do the wise men know where to go? i.e. to Judea. Well, after the conjunction with Regulus ends in 3 BC, Jupiter begins its retrograde motion on December the 1st, 3 BC. Now, Jupiter again comes in conjunction with Regulus on February the 17th, 2 BC. So about four or five months after Jesus is born, this alignment, the star at the rising, happens again on its own. Hence the wise men are able to set out of the stars rising and are able to see the journey through sometime in the next year, according to Matthew, and they are first led to Jerusalem. They get specific revelation through the scriptures, which points them to Bethlehem, and then the star rising and shows them the way to Bethlehem, right? And so all of these things are kind of lining up with these texts in Revelation chapter 12 and Revelation chapter 2, proving Paul's point in Romans 10 that the whole world should have known something was up the night Jesus was born. Now today we went over a lot of information, describing to us something amazing. And the point behind this is to bolster our faith both in the scriptures and in the power of God and in Jesus being the Son of God. He really is. And there are special things happening around his birth that have only happened for him. It was a divine, royal birth. But you know, that's actually not the end of the weird coincidences or the weird conjunctions that God is providing. It just so happens that September the 11th, 3 BC, was an extremely important date in the Jewish calendar. And that's where we're going to go next week. We're going to talk about what that date of September the 11th, 3 BC, means and how it helps to continue to prove that Jesus is the Son of God. Let's pray. Our Father, in the name of the Lord Jesus and in the power of your Holy Spirit, we come before your throne of grace. Father, we thank you so very much for your goodness and your love. Lord Jesus, I pray that we're able just to continue to be in awe and stand in wonder at your marvelous work. Father, thank you so very much for your Son, Jesus Christ, given to us. As we go, help us to know more about you. Help us to keep learning about you. Increase our faith in you. Help us to know your word more. And may we love one another. In your name do we pray. Amen. Let me send you off with a blessing from the book of Numbers. Chapter 6, verses 24 and on. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and truly give you his peace. Let us go in the name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. 